Sprinkled along the waste of years, full many a soft green isle appears. Pause where we may upon the desert road. Some shelter is in sight, some sacred safe abode. John Keebley. Welcome to this week's episode of Warfare, Advancement, and Revisionism. My name is Preston Floyd, and as always, I'm your host. I'd like to thank you all for joining me this week. I appreciate it. Uh, if you're a newcomer, welcome. Please feel free to uh, listen to this episode and go back and listen to our backlog. And if you're a returning listener, thank you guys. As always, I appreciate all the support. It really means a lot. Um, despite not having an episode last week, uh, we did have a decent number of downloads. So um, I'm hoping that means we'll have a lot of new listeners uh, joining us again uh for this one. So, um, I hope those of us who were in the U.S. Uh, that were able to partake in the holiday had a good and safe time. Um, I myself have been very uh, happy watching all the the football, the American football. Um, I've uh, that's mostly what I did with my last two weekends. So, uh, I've, I've had a nice relaxing break. Um, so, I hope the same is going on for you as well. And if you're also a football enjoyer, I hope your team. Uh, is at least doing okay, if not great. Ah, so now, uh, let's go ahead and dive into this episode's topic. Um, this week, we're going to be traveling a relatively short way off the coast of the Levant to visit the island of Cyprus and discuss the people living there during this season's time frame, which is 6,000 to 4,000 BC, BCE, what have you. Um, now, we've talked about the etymology of the island in previous episodes, discussing it, so if you would like a refresher on the theories for the name, go check out Season 2 and 3, uh, the, Saran- uh, the, the Cyprus episodes there. Now, the last time we visited the island, though, humans began to grow cops, in addition to gathering and hunting wild animals imported by earlier generation of humans. Animals like sheep, goats, dogs, and cattle though this was a very small number, and they died out within a couple hundred years, and they aren't brought back until sometime in the Bronze Age. So by this season, the cattle are non-existent. Now, all of these uh, replace native animals like dwarf elephants and pygmy hippos that died out either right before or right after humans first began to live on the island regularly. There is also more evidence of longer-term permanent uh, occupation sites. Um, Now, they were still in the pre-pottery Neolithic stage, or as is known for the island specifically, a ceramic Cyprus. This season sees this period of the island's prehistory come to an end and the start of the next phase. Now, the largest site associated with the aceramic period on Cyprus is Kirikatiya, This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and the name can be read in modern Greek as piglet, but in earlier forms it was probably something closer to boar or pig cradle. Uh, This place name has been in use for a very long time, and it could hint that this was used as a breeding ground for swine in an earlier undocumented time, though this is debated and there are other suggestions for the origin of the name. It may have originated from the word kirogetia, which implies the practice of palmistry, like palm reading. And another says it may have come from some initial name like iorkitida, uh, which is something like sacred place. These are all just theories though, and there are several more of them that you could read up on. Now, Uh, This was the largest of around 20 or so sites that shared more or less the same material culture. Uh, So in addition to tool designs uh, and favorite materials for said tools, they also shared uh, roundhouse designs or tholoi, to use the Greek term. And typically these all had stone foundations uh, made with river stones. The rest of the building structures were built using mud brick and had both flat or domed roofs. Uh, And in some cases, they created a primitive type of terrazzo of burned limestone to finish their floors. 
Now, there were clusters of houses with kind of shared spaces between them, kind of like an unwalled or uncovered courtyard. And there would be several clusters at each site. This is theorized to be separate family compounds. Uh, the sites also shared burial habits. Uh, the remains of the deceased were placed under houses in crouched or um, fetal positions. Um, there typically were not many grave goods buried with individuals, though there have been some that were found with grave goods. Uh, again, though, this is very rare, so it has had led some to think that these individuals were special in some way and that there might have been some kind of ancestor worship or veneration in play with those individuals. Um, now, uh, while they didn't have access to or know how to produce ceramics or pottery, they did have vessels that they worked from volcanic stone like andesite. And it seems that all the sites uh, made wide use of the large amounts of stone types on the island. Kirokatia saw the use of uh, the abundant stone to construct large walls, especially at this time. Um, these walls were uh, 2.5 meters tall uh, and they were at the thickest places 3 meters wide. Uh, so in uh, US measurements that's 8 feet uh, tall and nine feet wide. Now there were small gaps in these walls that were used as entrances but uh, they were very narrow and this made the site extremely well defended and closed off. Um, now there is a river nearby that would have made travel to and from the site a little bit easier but still it was very well insulated. Now these walls may have been used more for animal management than defense but Let's be real, with walls that size, not many people would even want to make an attempt at an attack on this type of settlement. Uh, good fences, good neighbors, that sort of thing. Now, uh, this river uh, that flows nearby was used to help Kirokatia grow crops and water their animals. The site was probably the largest food producer of all the ceramic sites on the island. So in addition to um, animal husbandry and farming, uh, hunting and gathering, the wild nuts and fruits of the island were also used to supplement the inhabitants' diets as well. Now, it is debated, but Kirikatea's population could have been as high as 600 people at its height. It could have been a little bit more, could have been a little bit less. It's hard to judge uh, from what we have found. Um, there does appear to have been some divisional labor between men and women, with women typically staying closer to the settlements and producing clothes and other materials in the domiciles, and then of course they would be distributed as needed uh, among you know, all the family units probably, and then maybe the community at large. Now the men typically uh, went out further and they would of course do things like hunt and tend to the herds but they also may have uh, been the primary foragers which is a little bit of a change from the hunter-gatherer days where men were typically doing most of the hunting and women were typically doing most of the foraging um, though i'm sure at times of harvest um, when you're actually harvesting your crops there would be more overlap in these types of roles and i'm sure that um, most people that were able to work uh, would have been involved in some way with the harvesting and uh, processing of um, all the, the crops they're growing. And the elderly of both sexes were probably also kept closer to home, though these individuals were not common. Uh, it appears that the people living on Cyprus died very young and there was a major infant mortality problem. The average age of men at death was around 35 and women was around 33. Uh, it also appears that nutrition was a problem and I've talked about this before, but this is a great example of people first switching to uh, a primary agriculture based diet. Uh, they being on average smaller than hunters and gatherers or nomadic pastoralists. Uh, 
humans are still in the process of evolving and adapting to this type of lifestyle and food, so their bodies weren't able to fully make use of the nutrition provided by their harvests. The men on average were about 160 centimeters or 5 feet 3 inches, and the women were about 150 centimeters, which is 4 foot 11. Now, who these people were is debated, but the theory that makes the most sense to me is that they were either an offshoot of the Natufian peoples, who we've talked about in prior seasons, or neighbors of the Natufians that had been heavily influenced by, by the Natufians. Now, the reason this makes the most sense to me is that the tools made by the Kirikateans are virtually identical to the Natufian designs used at the period Cyprus was first permanently settled. Also, the burial practices of these Natufian were very close to the uh, aceramic Cyprus groups, excuse me. Uh, though it um, is possible that they could have come from Anatolia as well, burial practices in all these groups is very similar uh, once you start getting to um, settled societies. But, um, though, of course, this leaves the question of why the tools were not more similar to these early Anatolians. Of course, it's possible that there were small groups from both places that merged, so sadly we don't have, uh, I don't think, at least I've seen any DNA uh, study or evidence from this period. Um, the remains found, unfortunately, have not had any uh, testable DNA. Now, at around the very start of our season, uh, season the uh, Kirikatean styles uh, or style sites uh, begin to break down, and Kirikatea sees a very big population drop. Uh, within a couple of hundred years, evidence of permanent agricultural settlements um, completely disappears on the island. In fact, until fairly recently, it was thought the entire human population died out or migrated out, or, you know, a combination of the two. Uh, though recently there has been evidence of small semi-nomadic groups still living in small numbers on the island. Um, what caused this breakdown is not really known, and there are several theories. Um, it's possible a disease spread on the island, uh, you know, with all these people newly adapting you know, agriculture, living in these very tight spaces, along with animals. Sanitation may have been a huge issue, and that, of course, is a known breeding ground for disease. And, um, you know, it could have spread very quickly through certain groups, and, you know, maybe one or two people left at a site, moved to another place looking for refuge, and then they spread it there. Um, it's also possible that um, Cyprus's climate went through a period of uh, poor rains or temperature variation, which is something that is happening in some places in other parts of the Levant, and they're they're very close to each other. Uh, and this may have led to um, making agriculture less viable in maintaining the population at these earlier levels. And of course, this also could have led to conflicts over agriculture or pasturage lands breaking out, which could have led to, you know, warfare or, you know, just infighting between the various groups. Um, and there may also have been uh, a massive amount of earthquakes or seismic activity on the island. The island has had this a number of times, and uh, we'll even see that in the historic period. Or, you know, it's possible that it's a combination of all of these things. But uh, this period of... Um, low habitation levels lasts around six to three hundred years give or take until around 5300 BC uh, at that point newcomers arrive on the island and they bring new tool designs um, or um, slightly I guess different types of tools um, or same types of tools but just made a little bit differently uh, they also bring with them pottery and the knowledge of how to make pottery. And this is the start of the ceramic Neolithic on the island. Now, the material culture of this period is known as the Sotira. The name comes from the type site of Sotira Tepes. 
And this was a tale near the small modern village of Sotira, which is the Greek for savior. Now, the, mo the modern village is very small. It only has around 100 people living there. Um, but the site at Sotira that they excavated had around 50 or so houses or structures, all tightly packed together. Um, there are no walls or defensive structures, at least that I am aware of from my reading. It's possible they could have had uh, smaller stone walls or maybe like wooden palisades, something like that, but there's no, there's nothing close to the, um, the Kirikatea uh, walls at, uh, at Sotira. Now, uh, Sotira sites do occasionally have rounded houses. However, for the most part, uh, they are rectangular, uh, but they do have rounded corners, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, now, these houses were also made of mud brick, but they did not have stone foundations. Instead, uh, the Satira people apparently like to dig uh, down a floor or two to make their, um, their living space a little bit more subterranean, perhaps to help them deal with uh, the heat or uh, something along those lines. Um, they also probably had flat roofs. Uh, there's no evidence of any kind of domed roofs. Now, um, they also did not bury their dead under the homes or in the walls of the homes. Instead, they would bury them on the settlement's outskirts. They had separate kind of graveyards. Um, and I, I could not get a firm answer, but I think they were burying them, or at least some of them were buried in in the large kind of urns um, that you'll see in other places. And I mentioned some, some examples of that uh, in some of the Levant episodes. And that's something you'll see in other places too. Um, <clears throat> now, their pottery also was extremely well made, um, especially compared to the early pottery we talked about that's emerging in the southern Levant uh, during this season as well. Um, the, the pieces were typically painted a dark red or a light brown, and in some cases they would um, comb them, you know, give them that comb-like patterns. And they would also, of course, um, tie ropes into them uh, to kind of give them that groove so that the, the ropes could be tied around and help them with carrying. Um, they also made them in a wide variety of shape and sizes. Um, now, it appears that all pottery production appears to have taken place in the homes. Uh, the homes had like hearth areas uh, where you would, of course, imagine you would cook and eat, uh, but then you also had like separate spaces for rooms, uh, and there were little kind of designated areas where apparently work was done. Uh, though I don't think there were too many walled off sections. Uh, there may have been some houses with kind of like little walls to keep spaces separate, but by and large, I think they were more open floor plans, which, you know, with the subterranean flooring, that kind of makes sense. Now, the satiric culture reaches its height around 5000 BC, give or take. And it had around 30 or so known sites, so a little bit more than the Kirikatean culture. In some cases, they even occupied uh, former Kirikatean sites. Uh, in fact, uh, they even occupied Kirikatea, or Kirikatea, excuse me, itself. Uh, though it should be noted that uh, pottery production appears to have only happened in or near coastal settlements. They probably were used to using um, salt water in the pot production that may have made it um, may have allowed them to, to manipulate the clay a little bit better um, so it's possible that the interior sites were reoccupied by remnants of the Kirokatia uh, peoples who initially only traded with the Sotira for pottery before you know a couple of centuries of you know interaction led to these interior peoples adopting other traditions and culture in addition to the satira pottery. Um, now, I could not get any firm demographic information about satira lifespan or height, uh, but since no special note has been made of it, I would imagine that they're fairly in line with the rest of the Near East at this period. Um, but 
uh, around 4,500, the Sotira also collapse, or rather they see a huge drop in population and sites. Um, like the Kirigatira, we don't know what caused this, though all the same theories that apply to the uh, Kirigatia uh, are applied to the Sotir. We, we just don't know. Um, unlike the Kirigatia, though, um, the Sotira do not disappear completely. They remain in a small number of sites. I think it's, it's around 10 or so, though that number fluctuates over time, um, but they do still occupy a handful of locations. And they will continue to see occupation until after this season ends. And they will you know, continue to be lived in even after um, that point too. But at that point, uh, the Satira culture disappears. They are subsumed by the next culture and people uh, to arrive on the island. And this is the culture known as the Irimi. And these people are the ones that usher in the Chocolithic period to the island, uh, the Copper Age. Um, we will cover them next time as the uh, they don't really firmly show up in the archaeological record. There's some evidence that, they, that they're starting to arrive right at the end of the season, but they don't really stand out all that much uh, until next season. Um, but they do very quickly... Uh, take over the island. And I believe that this period is probably the longest uninterrupted stretch in um, Cypriot history. Um, after that, you'll see just a lot of different changes. You go from um, period to period much quicker after the Chocolithic period on uh, Cyprus ends. Um, but uh, Cyprus is very important because it is an excellent source of copper, and I think tin as well. I think there are small, small amounts of tin on the island too, uh, both of which are needed to create bronze, but uh, copper is definitely available on the island, so it would make sense that um, you know it would become very important very quickly um, in the Bronze Age. So, uh, But that's all stuff we'll refer to in the future. Um, so... I hope you look forward to that. Um, oh, uh, the Satira, uh, in terms of people, um, much like uh, the Kirikatea people before them, we are not sure of their origins. Um, though I have read more people suggesting that perhaps that this was a primarily, primarily Anatolian, like Southern Anatolian group, um, with maybe some influx as well from places like the Northern Levant, who we'll be covering next week. Um, again, the reason for this is just house layout, uh, burial practices, that sort of thing. Um, but it is hard to say because, again, as far as I'm aware, um, I haven't seen any DNA from this period. There's DNA after this period, um, but as we will talk about when we talk about Anatolia and Europe, um, Anatolians are very much in a wave of migration uh, constantly out of the peninsula in search of new farmlands, pasturage, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that is all stuff that's going to be very important uh, for the next couple of episodes, and um, then we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, next week... Uh, and I say next week because I, I have kind of burned through my notes. I thought this would take a, at least, you know, five, ten minutes longer, but uh, I got through everything fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, next week we'll be talking about the Northern Levant and Southern Anatolia, and kind of the sites there, what we know about them. Uh, and then after that, I believe we're probably going to... I, I haven't decided if I want to move directly into Mesopotamia or if I want to cover the rest of Anatolia, or if I maybe want to co cover Anatolia as part of Southern Europe. Um, if I do that, it will only be Western Anatolia. Um, Eastern Anatolia, Southern Anatolia, those are going to be tied into their neighboring regions. Not because it's not an important region, it's extremely important, it's just that the... Um, 
the archaeology kind of ties them more, at least the literature ties them more to their neighbors rather than to themselves. But Anatolia is home to a number of peoples who will emerge as societies and cultures and states and that kind of thing. Um, but there's always, it seems like Anatolia is a very major crossroad, and for good reason. And that's all stuff we're going to be talking about uh, at least the next week or two um, when we talk about the northern Levant and southern Anatolia, Mesopotamia, all that kind of stuff. So uh, thank you all for joining me this week. I hope um, this was informative. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, please feel free to provide any feedback or anything like that. I always love to hear from listeners. Um, you can contact me via email at war at revpod at gmail.com you can send me a direct message on twitter slash x you can also comment on the youtube videos i do read those it may take me a day or two to see them um of course if you comment on more recent videos you're more likely to be seen sooner and if you um do subscribe to me on youtube i do stream regularly during the week i play history games um, I've been playing as the Ottoman Empire in EU4, so I'm very familiar with the, the region at the 14 to 1700 period. Um, we're in a little bit of a tight spot uh, in the playthrough right now, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. I'm hoping to get at least one achievement out of this run, uh, and I'll be playing that tomorrow or today, depending on when you're listening to this. And then uh, I do other games, too. Uh, I kind of alternate games based on the day but feel free to drop by say hi um you're welcome to comment there and uh if you do want to send me a link though you'll have to do it via twitter or gmail youtube does not allow you to post com uh, links in the live chat you can leave a comment afterward the fact but um it won't do it while i'm live but please feel free to drop by say hello just say what you think there i'm always happy to hear uh feedback, constructive criticism, just general support, all that kind of stuff. But yeah, thank you all for joining me. I hope you have a good rest of your day and a rest of your week. I'll see everyone next week. Thank you all. Goodbye.